Today I want to talk to you about evolution, and what is it? Well, let's first start with a definition. The word evolution means to change over time. Everything changes over time, and so we can use the word evolution outside of biology. We can talk about how art has evolved, or we can talk about how someone's music career has evolved, or how my fashion has evolved over time. You know, and so this is just change over time. But when we talk about biology, what we mean when we say evolution is change of allele frequency over time. Now, you might not be familiar with what alleles are. So instead of alleles, I'm going to use the word genes, because you've probably heard genes. But know that specifically, it's not the genes, it's the alleles that are changing. Okay, so then we're going to say that evolution is the change of genes over time. What does this mean? Well, this means that if you have a species or a population, a group of organisms, and the percentages of their genes have changed over time, then you have evolution. It's as simple as that. Let's look at humans getting taller. And so humans are our population. And so let's say that all humans were four feet tall thousands of years ago. And if taller individuals reproduced more, let's say that you had a 1% of the population was only five feet tall. And if the taller individuals reproduced more, then we'll have more taller individuals in our population because they're reproducing. And so if we go from 1% of the population is five feet tall, and over maybe 100 years, we have now 10% of the population is five feet tall. And then over another 100 years, we have 80% of the population is five feet tall. And then we start looking at six feet tall, right? And then so we can say that our population is evolving, it's getting taller, there has been a change of allele frequency or a change of genes over time. That is evolution. Okay, so let's talk about this guy Darwin. So Darwin in the mid 1800s, he wrote a book about natural selection. And so Darwin did not discover evolution. He did not invent evolution. What Darwin did was he described the mechanisms of evolution. So Darwin described how evolution works, and that's really why he's famous. So Darwin came up with these mechanisms, and there's four mechanisms, but we're only gonna talk about three of them today. We have natural selection, artificial selection, and sexual selection. Now they all end in the word selection, because it's who gets to reproduce is going to be affecting evolution. So if there's no reproduction, there is no evolution because you're not passing your genes on. All right, so let's talk about the first one, natural selection, and this is probably the most popular. There was an economist in the early 1900s that created or that said something that became very famous. It's survival of the fittest. Darwin didn't say that, it was an economist survival of the fittest. And I think survival of the fittest is a really good way to think about natural selection because whoever survives, whoever outperforms the other individuals is going to reproduce the most and pass on their genetics. And that is gonna be what affects evolution. So I'm gonna use a hyperbolic story to show you an example of how evolution can take place. All right, so Let's, let's look at deer. Okay, so deer have these long antlers that they use to fight with. Okay, so thousands of years ago, there was a species of deer that didn't have these antlers. So let's talk about how these antlers could evolve. Okay, so you have all of these deer with no antlers, and they still ram their heads together and they fight. The male that wins the fights gets to reproduce with all the females in his area. And so he's going to spread his genetics. So there's a lot riding on winning these fights. Well, mutations are a random thing that happens in our genetics. A mutation happens to you before you're born. 
And so a mutation can happen to the sperm or the egg or even the zygote or the fetus as it's developing. And this mutation is in your DNA. And so if this mutation is in your DNA, then you can pass it on to your children. And so let's say that a deer was born with a mutation, giving it two little bumps on its head. We're not talking huge antlers, we're just talking two little bumps on its head, so it's a mutation. Now when that deer goes to fight, those bumps help it and it's gonna win more fights and then it's gonna get to reproduce. And then it's gonna pass on those genetics to its children. And so this mutation, which started in one individual, is now gonna be passed on to its offspring. And so now all these little deer are born with these two little bumps on its head. Well, just like you, you probably have siblings and some of you are taller and some of you are shorter and all of you come out different heights. So the same thing happens with most of our genetics. And so you have these deer born with little bumps on their heads. Well, they go around winning fights and reproducing more. Well, the ones that have slightly bigger bumps on their head are gonna win more fights and reproduce more. And then their offspring are gonna have slightly larger bumps on their head. And so this will continue until we get the crazy looking antlers that we have now. And this can be applied to most species and most situations when we talk about evolution. My students like to talk about giraffes because giraffes have this incredibly long neck. Most of my students think that giraffes evolved a long neck so they can reach leaves on a tree. Well, we actually think that giraffes evolved their neck due to fighting. Most of the time, it's due to fighting for mates. That's what usually drives natural selection. And so you have these giraffes that swing their heads into each other trying to fight. Well, the one with the longer neck and the more powerful head is able to win more fights. And so they get to reproduce more. And this continues until we get these exaggerated, very long-necked giraffes. Sometimes two different species can be driving each other's own evolution. Let's look at wolves and rabbits. Okay? Wolves will eat rabbits, and so rabbits need to run away from the wolves. And so what happens is if you're the slowest rabbit, you're gonna get eaten and you're not gonna be able to reproduce. And so what happens is the fastest rabbits survive and get to reproduce. And so they pass on those genes, those genetics to be quick and fast. And so rabbits slowly get faster and faster. Well, wolves will also have to evolve to get faster to catch the rabbits. But there's other ways to catch rabbits than just speed. So intelligence can also help them catch the, the rabbits. And so the wolves that work together as a team that can work in a pack, they're gonna to get to reproduce because they catch the most rabbits and they get to eat the most and they're healthy and they can reproduce. And so the rabbits cause the wolves to evolve intelligence and speed and the wolves cause the rabbits to evolve speed. And so they're affecting each other. There's this co-evolution going on. The next mechanism of evolution is artificial selection. Now, in the first mechanism, natural selection, you can think of it as nature choosing who gets to reproduce. But in artificial selection, it's humans choosing who gets to reproduce. And we're choosing organisms based on traits that we like. Now, this does not help them with natural selection. This does not help them out in nature. But they do reproduce more because we are choosing who reproduces. Now, Darwin noticed this with racehorses. Darwin noticed that racehorses in captivity were faster than wild horses. And the reason is, whichever racehorse wins the most races is the one that we reproduce. And so it's passing on those genetics to its children. And we keep doing this until racehorses get incredibly fast compared to the wild horses. Humans have been doing this for a very long time. We choose the cow that produces the most milk. And that cow is going to reproduce the most because we want more of those cows. But also, we have to keep impregnating the cow so that way it'll keep producing the milk. And so, over time, we've produced cows that produce much more milk than their own offspring need. And so, this is considered artificial selection. This is what we've done with our pet dogs. Our pet dogs and wolves are the same species. It's hard to imagine a pack of chihuahuas running through a forest trying to take down a, a deer. <laughs> but they are the same species as a wolf. So what happened was, at first, all dogs looked the same. They were the same species, they looked about the same. And then humans chose traits that we liked and we would reproduce them 
until we genetically created these different breeds of dogs. So let's say that we do want a little Yorkie or a little Chihuahua or a little tiny dog. How do we go about that? Well, what we do is we take all these dogs and we find the shortest one. And then we try and find another short one and we reproduce them together. And they're gonna pass on those shorter genes to their offspring. And then from that litter of dogs, we're gonna take the shortest one and try and find another short one somewhere and reproduce them together. And they're gonna pass on those short genes. And we keep doing this and what happens is we get smaller and smaller dogs. We can do this with pretty much any trait and we've done this a lot with dogs. And the dog traits that we have chosen, we've chosen them sometimes for hunting, sometimes for sport, we've chosen them for looks, we've chosen them for pets, all kinds of different traits that we have created. This is not nature, this is humans choosing it, which is artificial selection. Our next mechanism of evolution is sexual selection. In sexual selection, this is when the opposite sex chooses who gets to reproduce. And so this usually happens with either looks or some type of song or a mating dance or something that has to do with attracting a mate. If we look at birds, birds are very beautiful because birds are a visual animal. They have really good eyesight. And what happens is the females are choosing the mate based on looks. This is how we get the crazy peacock. If we look at peacocks, uh, peacocks are the male, peahens are the female, peafowls is the name of the species. So if we looked at how this evolved in peafowls, we can assume that a long time ago all peafowls looked the same. Well, so you have all peafowls looking the same. And then we have a male peacock that is born with a mutation, a single feather sticking out of its rear end. Now, the single feather doesn't give it any advantages in nature. It doesn't fly better, it doesn't get in the way of anything, but the single feather is something different and interesting. And so the peahens find this attractive. So this male peacock's walking around with this single feather and the female peahens are like, Damn, look at him, he's got it going on. And so now, all the peahens want to mate with that one peacock. And so that one peacock is going to spread its DNA, it's going to spread that single feather that's sticking out of its rear end. And so what happens is, all of his children now have that single feather. Well, the peahens all want to reproduce with those males because they have something special that the other males don't. Eventually we see peafowls that all have this single feather, and it's no longer special. Well, then one day, one's born with a mutation and has two feathers sticking out of its rear end, and the females are like, damn, he's got it going on. He's got two feathers. And so now all the females want to reproduce with that peacock, and so he passes on his genes. This continues until what we have is called runaway selection, when it gets incredibly crazy like the way that we have peacocks now. And so having this giant tail does not help peacocks. A tiger can easily put its paw down onto the tail of this peacock and catch him and eat him. Peacocks can barely fly because of these huge tail feathers, but it helps them reproduce. And helping you reproduce is really what's needed in order to affect evolution and spread your DNA. We also see this with other creatures such as crickets. Crickets chirp in order to attract a mate. So all the male crickets are chirping at night to try and attract the females. The females are gonna go find the loudest cricket. Now again, this does not help you with natural selection because everything in nature wants to eat a cricket. If you were basically the Doritos of nature, would you wanna sit in a bush going, here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am? No, you wouldn't wanna do that. But if it helped you get the ladies, you would. And so the male crickets chirp trying to reproduce. And what happens is the loudest male reproduces, passing on those genes, and crickets get louder and louder. The same thing is going on with frogs. The male frogs croak, and the females go find the loudest male. Now, this can also slightly affect natural selection as well, because the frog that croaks the loudest is usually also the strongest, because he can create the most air, he can, he's loud, he's vibrous, 
He's also healthy enough to be able to croak that loud. So it is a good way of selecting a mate because the females, just by listening, are finding the strongest mates. And so sexual selection is when the opposite sex is choosing who to reproduce, and it's not necessarily based on natural selection. And so looking at these three selections, these mechanisms explain almost all of nature's trends in evolution. And so Darwin did not discover evolution. What he did was explain how it worked and how it happened. We're gonna to continue to talk more about evolution, but hopefully this gives you a basic idea of how evolution works and the three mechanisms that drive it.